If you've heard of the Kama Sutra before, you might think that it's just a book full of sex positions. I mean, that's usually how it's portrayed in popular culture. But you'd be wrong to think that it's just about sex positions. It's also about foreplay. Nah, but really, there's actually a philosophy of life here that isn't really brought to light often enough. And there are a lot of connections to Indian history, especially with Hinduism, so a random guy like me obviously won't be able to pick up on everything. But just reading the text itself still provides a lot. There's practicality in the Kama Sutra, not just with the, you know, obvious stuff, but also regarding what to really pursue in life. Like what role should pleasure and eroticism play in one's life? What else is equally as important to pursue? In addition to these practical questions, the Kama Sutra can sometimes be a confusing text with verses being somewhat vague and contradictory, meaning that there's going to be a lot of room for discussion. So without further ado, let's penetrate our way into this often misunderstood text. Welcome to Philosophy Tunes, I'm Paul, and uh, this is certainly going to make me more hesitant to share this channel with people I know in real life. So before we dive into the material, we should address the history regarding this book as it relates to the philosophy in it. The Kama Sutra is said to have been attributed to an Indian philosopher by the name of Vatsyayana in the 2nd century, but this is a bit of an incomplete story. The book isn't so much as an original writing, but more of a compilation of past writings. According to Vatsyayana, the lord of creatures named Prajapati wrote 100,000 of these verses about pretty much all things in life. Then this mystical being named Nandi took those verses that were about pleasure and compiled a work known as the Kama Shastra. Then the book went through many summarizations, reductions, and groupings, until eventually Vatsyayana summarized what was available to him, and thus the Kama Sutra was born. If I got any of that wrong, just let me know in the comments. Now if we have all these verses about all things in life, and Nandi only took the verses about pleasure and that eventually became the Kama Sutra, then you might ask about the other verses. And lo and behold there are two other works that Vatsyayana points out that were created. The Dharma Shastra is a work that collects the aphorisms based on civic virtues, and the Artha Shastra is about prosperity and economics. Now I was able to find this book of the Artha Shastra, but I couldn't find anything for the Dharma Shastra, so let me know if it's out there available somewhere. Hopefully I didn't bore you with all that, but it is relevant, I promise, because the very first verse of the Kama Sutra is as follows. Praised be the three aims of life, virtue, dharma, prosperity, artha, and love, kama, which are the subject of this work. Also, I'm using this translation of the book by Elaine Daniel Liu, just for reference. Now we should probably address what kama is, because it's a little confusing. Based on that quote, you might think it's just about love, but then we have this verse here. Kama signifies the mental inclination toward the pleasures of touch, sight, taste, and smell, to the extent that the practitioner derives satisfaction for it. So it seems here that Kama is more about pleasure. And when you read further into this work, it's obvious that this book isn't just about love, but more generally about pleasure. So I think that's a more accurate translation. Now remember, Kama, or pleasure, is just one part of our three aims of life, the other two being Artha and Dharma. Artha is defined like this. Artha signifies material goods, wealth. Artha consists of acquiring and increasing, within the limits of dharma, knowledge, land, gold, cattle, patrimony, crockery, furniture, friends, clothing, etc. So if kama is the pleasure, artha is mostly our material goods, the things we need to sustain life. You know, food, shelter, water, clothing, but also non-material stuff like friends and knowledge. Now since procreation is hopefully pleasurable for you, we might say that creating life falls within the realm of Kama. Then, Artha comes in to sustain that life. Vatsyayana says, in order to live, the use of material goods is indispensable. The sluggard will never prosper. Now Dharma, the third aim of life, is the most complicated. Because although it's translated as virtue, the text isn't very descriptive as to what that means exactly, and the job of explaining that is pretty much kicked off to other works. The rule of virtue, which are connected with the spiritual life, can only be known through authoritative texts. So with our three aims of life in hand, it's kind of interesting how popular culture seems to ignore these other two aims, and views the Kama Sutra as an isolated, hedonistic text when in actuality it's just part of a puzzle. On the other hand, it's also interesting that pleasure gets its own seat at the table, because if I just ask you intuitively to come up with three aims of life, I doubt many of you are thinking about pleasure, let alone erotic pleasure. 
So the Kama Sutra pays respect to pleasure, which is often neglected in certain other philosophical views, while also not being the full-on hedonistic text that it's often made out to be. So although the Kama Sutra focuses on pleasure, on the erotic, the other aims of life should not be neglected. Through the Kama Sutra, Vatsyayana defines the approaches to erotic practice. So it's not just some pornographic text, even if it was a bit awkward to read in public at IOP naked. Now one might ask if one of these aims of life should take precedent over another. Like are material goods more important than pleasure? What about virtue? Many philosophers would put a large amount of importance on virtue. Well, it's complicated. You see, Vatsyayana initially says that all these aims are equal. During the 100 years of his life, a man must pursue the three aims successively, without one being prejudicial to another. So this sounds like all the aims should be treated equally, but other verses say otherwise. For example, at some point it sounds like Artha, the goods used for sustaining life, should be given more respect. Money is the basis of royal power. Life's journey is based on it. It is the means of realizing the three aims of life. It does seem true that money can help one achieve those other two aims. Like if you're rich, that means more money to donate to charity, more personal financial security so you could volunteer to help others. And money, well, obviously can help you obtain pleasure, so we don't really need to get into that. And then there's other verses that seem to put the importance on dharma, or virtue. The relative importance and value of things must be taken into account. Money is more important than love, social success more important than success in love, and virtue more important than success and fortune. So yeah, it's a bit ambiguous as to which aim is more important, if there even is an inequality of importance in the first place. But hey, what do you think? Do you consider one of these three aims to be more important than the other? And that's the general idea behind the philosophy of the Kama Sutra. There's obviously a lot left out. There's even a fourth aim of life, Moksha, which I didn't have time to talk about. And obviously I'm not gonna review or even talk about all the sex positions on YouTube. That's just ridiculous. However, all right guys, I'm gonna wrap it up here. I'm definitely no expert when it comes to this sort of stuff, so if I missed anything or misunderstood anything, just let me know in the comments below. This video will probably get demonetized, so do me a favor and subscribe, like, and hit the bell to support the channel. And with that, I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.